There is none to shape him who has formed every hand. He hath made the mouth of man. As the oracles of God. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, righteousness basically boils down to what is right what is holy, what is true, what is innocent. And righteousness, it's what is objective, unbiased, and impartial. There's no spinner interpretation on it. It's either right or it isn't. It's either true or it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's objective, unbiased, and impartial because it's based on the mind of God. It's communicated by the commandments of God. And it's performed by the works of God, all of these and all of which are above and beyond the influence of man. That's where that's what righteousness is based on and where it comes. It comes from God. Mm -hmm. Now the world, the agents of Satan, they like to say that there's more than one truth. You hear that out in the world all the time. There's his truth, there's her truth. Well, there's one truth. If he says something happened, she says something didn't happen, well, somebody's lying. Somebody's telling the truth. It's not both. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. The world will say there's more than one truth. The world will say that what is right is subjective and determined by each individual. What's right in your own eyes is what's right. That's the world's teaching. That's Satan's teaching. Those are lies because the devil is a liar. He was a liar from the beginning. Mm -hmm. There's only one truth and one righteousness, and that's of God. There's only one God, and there's only one way to reach God. That's through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's John 14, verse 6. So righteousness is what is right, and it comes from God. Now, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is not just a simple desire for what is right, but like food and water, we hunger and thirst for food and water. The presence or absence of righteousness is life or death for the human soul. If we go without food and we go without water, what happens? We die. Now, a soul can go along for a period of time without food and water, but they don't do very well. And if it goes on long enough, they die. It's the same thing with righteousness. A person can walk in the world for a time, but they don't do very well, spiritually speaking. And if they're there long enough, eventually it will kill them spiritually, except the Lord calls them out of the world and they obtain the righteousness of God. That's how critical having righteousness in our life and walking righteously before God is. It's life or death for us. Now, Righteousness in our life, that's applied to ourselves first. We have to look at ourselves and see how we measure up to God, God's, to God's standards. And then we can help others get there too, admonishing them in love and giving them the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, like our food and water, we must take diligent care to ensure that what we think is right is in fact genuinely right. It's one thing you can look at something and think it's right, but we have to search it out and make sure it actually is. Like our food and water, we want to make sure that spiritually 
what we have in our life is clean and wholesome. We want to make sure that what we have spiritually is beneficial to our spiritual health and not contaminated by things that are spiritually harmful. You see the parallel between our food and water and righteousness? Yeah, it's, a, it's that critical. Because we, if we eat something that's contaminated, it makes us sick and can even kill us. It's the same thing with the word of God and the righteousness of God. It can't be mixed in with other stuff. That's how Satan caused man to fall in the first place. He said something that was true that was mixed in with a lie. He said, thou shalt not surely die when he was speaking to Eve in the garden. That was a lie. But he also mixed in a little bit of truth that your eyes will be opened and you'll be as gods. Mm -hmm. See? It was a straight up lie, but he had some truth mixed in there too to give it some credence. It's the same thing with the word of God. We have to keep it pure and we have to not mix it with the mind of man or with the doctrines of the world. We are to keep it pure. So how do we do this? As far as the righteousness in our life goes, we have the objective reference of the Word of God. That's our standard. If you think about it in a natural sense, when we compare something to a standard, uh, weights and measures. How do we know an inch is an inch? How do we know a pound is a pound? There are reference standards established by Bureau of the Government that everything else is traced back to. So if somebody says something that, like a calipers are measuring an inch, it's because those calipers have been checked against a known standard that everyone agrees on. And they can say, yes, these calipers do measure accurately because we've checked them against the known standard. Again, the scale that we have, we know it measures weight accurately because it's been checked against a known standard. We know when it says it's a pound, it is a pound. It's on there. The same thing is with the Word of God and how we apply it to our lives. We go back to the standard reference of the King James Bible. And yes, I preach out of the King James Bible because it is the closest translation in English that we have to the original Greek and Hebrew transcripts. And it was done so that the common people, when this translation was made, back in the 1600s, it was done so the common people would have access to the word of God for themselves without having to go through the priests who only preached in Latin and did not preach it in the common tongue. Give free, it was quite a work that happened here when the King James was printed because it opened it up to everyone instead of just a select few who could control it and decide who got to hear what. The other thing about the King James is it's not under copyright. There's a lot of new versions that have come out that are under copyright. In other words, somebody is getting royalties off of printing that stuff. There's money involved. And we all know what the scripture said. The love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. So we preach out of the King James because it's the pure and unadulterated word of God. It hasn't been influenced by other factors. Mm -hmm. So that's our standard reference, folks. Yeah. We have to know the word and we refer back to the word when we're trying a matter, when we're trying our, our own souls are being tried to make sure that we are standing in the righteousness of God. And those souls that are diligent in searching out what is genuinely right and true and holy, they will obtain those very things that they're searching out and will have those things within them. We diligently search out what is righteous, truly righteous, we'll have it within us. God, because God will honor that diligence for us. Again, going back to the illustration of food and water, that old saying, you are what you eat. So if we, if we spiritually eat the pure word of God, it's been unadulterated by anything else, guess what? That's that purity going into us. Mm -hmm. So blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Yeah. We will be filled with righteousness when we seek after it, like our food and water. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now mercy is the active exercising of compassion towards others, and especially when they've provoked you in the towards the opposite. When a soul 
has been provoked by another towards anger or annoyance or apathy, and they show compassion on that soul, that's mercy. Now, showing mercy, it doesn't guarantee there's a fair payback from those that mercy was shown to. Sometimes you show compassion, it doesn't get repaid. But we're to look for to God for our reward. We always keep our focus on the heavenly, the spiritual places and our focus on God. He'll re- he rewards us for what we do, regardless of the earthly, th- earthly circumstance. And that's a trying of our faith. When we show mercy to another soul, we show that compassion to another soul, even if it doesn't come back to us the way we think it should or the way we want it to, God sees everything and he rewards us for our diligence. As long as we keep that, keep our love, we don't become embittered or angry over maybe not getting requited. And sometimes showing that compassion, there is a great reward over and above what we give out. Sometimes it happens that way too. In the end, spiritually speaking, it's always over great reward over and above because God has many good things laid up for us in his kingdom. The exercising of compassion one towards another That's how we learn to walk in each other's shoes. That's how we learn to perceive the state that another soul is in. That's how we learn to defer our own desires and meet the needs of the other soul. So again, we don't always know where it's gonna go. Like Saul of Tarsus, before he became Paul, he persecuted the church relentlessly. And yet when the time came God knocked him off his high horse and struck him blind. And God sent another, a saint, Ananias, to go lay hands on Paul and recover his sight, physically speaking and spiritually speaking. The Ananias, he had to step into that place of exercising that great compassion against a known and very vicious enemy of the church. But what what came out of that? Paul Saul became Paul, a builder of the church, writer of many epistles in the New Testament, an apostle that established churches all over the Mediterranean area and really launched the Christian doctrine into the world beyond Israel, where it was first preached. So there was quite an orchestration of God. But that that, that one soul, Ananias, he had to not only obey God, but show that genuine compassion to that soul, even though it didn't look very good at all at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're to be as well. Things happen in the flesh and in this life when we go through, and yeah, there's interactions one with another, and sometimes they aren't pleasant. The Lord will create situations so that we're exercised in that compassion. Mm -hmm. Now, more than exercising compassion, Mercy is also an exercising of other things. It's an exercising of our patience, where we stick with a soul and see them through if they keep moving forward with the Lord. It's an exercising of our faith. Yeah. Do we believe that the Lord will reward us? Do we believe that showing this compassion does do good? Yeah. Even if we can't see the end result. It's an exercising of humility. That's very important in the eyes of the Lord, that humility. Yeah, having taking that lower place, not thumping our own chest and you know putting someone down for something that they've done or that we think they've done, but um, taking a step back and seeing where they're actually at and how we can help them. Mm-hmm. Compa- and that mercy, that's also an exercising of true Christian charity. Mm-hmm. When Paul wrote about charity in First Corinthians thirteen. He used the word agape in the Greek. That doesn't mean just love. It means a love feast in the plural sense. There's an interaction with multiple entities, one with another. See, a body ministry. And that's how the Lord grows our love is, and our mercy, our compassion, and all the other gifts, is having a body ministry where we interact one with another in the Spirit. Mercy is also the subduing of the carnal, fleshly nature of man. And what I mean by that is the flesh 
if someone does wrong, the automatic response is to, you know, hammer him into the ground over a mistake. Yeah, crush him, smack him, whatever. Now there is, there are consequences for mistakes and there is discipline that does need to be involved. But that's done in the love and admonition of the Lord, not crushing the human soul, not blasting them, but entreating them to recover if they make a mistake. Yeah. So mercy subdues that carnal nature that wants to crush the human soul. And its mercy is that demonstration of the same love that the Lord has for the human soul. When Jesus Christ of Nazareth was scourged, spit on, beaten, mocked, crucified, what was his response? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's Luke 23, 34. So when we have that example before us, the things that we face when we interact with one another, they really pale by comparison. Mm -hmm. So what great mercy the Lord showed, even though all these horrible things have been done to him, he still asked his father to forgive them. It's quite something too, because it actually, it had made a way for those that would repent of that act and come out and come into the places of the Lord.